Welcome to Destination Animation, your trip around the world of cartoons and anime, stop motion and puppetry, special effects and CGI, and everything in between. I'm your host, Jason Knott. And I am Carrie Dreblo, and today we are talking about BoJack Horseman. In particular, it's fifth season, but we are going to talk about the show in general, too. Uh, Fifth season just premiered a couple weeks ago, so uh, relevance. Relevance. Topical. Also, yay, BoJack Horseman, sort yay. of, question mark. I don't know if we should be saying <laughs> yay. The show kind of gets depressing. <laughs> yeah, very. Uh, also, Becca is not here with us today. It is just Carrie and Jason, because she is taking a mental health break. Yeah, Becca, we miss you. We'll see you back soon, hopefully. Yes. All right, and uh, for this BoJack episode, we are definitely going to split it into two parts, just like the Adventure Time episode, just because this is a thing that just premiered, so... Mm-hmm. Um, this episode is kind of going to be one half, you know, at first talking about why people who have not watched BoJack Horseman need to now. Now. Um, and the second half, you know, we'll actually do some analysis of the season that just premiered. So, uh, yes. yeah, uh, Jason, so we like, obviously, we both have a history of BoJack Horseman. So uh, I think we should start by talking about, like, how exactly did we uh, get into BoJack Horseman and... Uh, what compelled us to keep watching it? Well, I don't know. What did get you into BoJack Horseman and what compelled you to keep watching it? Oh, I thought I was asking you. <laughs> you were asking me? I was asking you. Stop dodging the question, damn it. All right, I'll, <laughs> I'll go first. Uh, I basically got into the show from Becca's recommendation, which I think she got from her brother to get into the show herself. And, like, I I think I'd seen trailers for it. And it just looked like another random, like, you know, adult animated cartoon. LOL, so random. Yeah, and, like, I don't know what eventually got me into it, but, like, one day I was just at home on my day off. Well, I don't even think I was working back then. Dang. Uh, I was just at home and browsing Netflix and decided to give it a try, and then, you know, I I just got hooked on the really random stupid humor, like... (laughs) Season there definitely one. is a lot of random stupid humor in season one. Like, the the whole show is, it's humans and animals kind of living together. Anthropomorphic animals, like, everything is the size of a human. Even, like, a, a mouse or a snake. And, like, there were just these really silly animal-related puns, like, uh, this character called Princess Carolyn. She's a, a cat, and her name is Princess Carolyn. It's great. And, like, she she has a ringtone that's just the Jellicle Cats song from the musical Cats <laughs> <laughs> that plays, like, three times, and it's funny every time. They do make a lot of animal-related jokes. Yeah. Especially in season one. Yeah, as it went on, like, as they started to get into the meat of BoJack and kind of what he wants to do, like, with his life and his career and how he kind of wants to be accepted not just to, you know, give him something to do, but also because he is really, you know, emotionally empty. Wait, Bojack, isn't he that horse from Horsin' Around? Yeah, aren't you the horse from Horsin' Around? The Horsin' Around is the show, the sort of, like, Full House, Family Matters show in the 90s he was in. Yeah, 90s sitcoms. Yeah, and it's sort of been his high point in his career and also the low point of his, like, emotional life. Yeah, basically, he started in the show during, it, it ran for like six seasons, even though it was objectively cheesy, just mm-hmm. again, kind of like Full House, but, um, you know, it's like, people liked it back then. Yeah. And I think he's based a lot of his own life and his own expectations on what life is on that show and on, you know, TV tropes in general, and the show takes a, you know, a great, like, dig on those tropes and why they they don't work in real life. But yeah, we can talk about sure. it later. But, uh, Carol- yeah, we Car- are going to talk about that. Carolyn. Carolyn. <laughs> Carrie. Oh, yes. How did you get say, onto the show? Hey, I have, my name is Carolyn, and there's a character named Carolyn, and she's a cat. Awesome. <laughs> I like nice. all of these things. <laughs> <laughs> but how did you get into the show, Carrie? Um, so basically, like, even though I have a Netflix account, I honestly don't watch a lot of the original shows, but me being an animation nerd, I do sometimes watch their original animated series, and... Again, I think it was you and Becca that uh, recommended this show, and I started watching it. And again, at first, it's just kind of very, it's funny, but it's silly. And that I was hooked as soon as they started getting into the deeper themes. Like, 
the way that I watch stuff, I like kind of being a philosophical watcher. I like yeah. shows that make me think. And this show very, very earnestly deals with depression and how there aren't really easy answers. So when what really got me hooked in was the melancholy scenes in the beginning. Like there's this great scene with Princess Carolyn where she's in the office alone at night and like her phone rings off. It's your 40th birthday. And yeah. she kind of just sighs. And she spent that whole episode like, you know, doing stuff for Bojack and her other clients. Cause she's an agent in uh, Hollywood or Hollywood as it's come to known to be yes, known. Hollywood. And, like, sh- that whole episode has just been focused on her. I think it's the first time that the show is focused solely on her as an episode. And every episode that focuses on her ends with that sort of, like, low note, where it's just like, man, PC. <laughs> yeah. She gets the raw end of the deal in a lot of the episodes of the show. Yeah. like More so last season, but, oh, yeah. you know, geez, season four was just brutal. No one even knows that it's her birthday, and, like, it took to the very end until we knew that it was her birthday, and it's just sad. Yeah. But, okay, another thing that got me into the show, Vincent Adult Man. Vincent Adult Man. Oh, no. (laughs) That's one character from season one I wish would come back. (laughs) Yeah. Season one, season two. Basically, yeah. Princess Carolyn has been in a relationship off and on with Bojack, and so she, like, when they finally officially break up, she tries, like... She tries to find someone. I need a real man. How about you? And it's just two <laughs> kids stacked in a trench coat. What's your name, stud? Uh, Vincent. Uh, Vincent. <laughs> adult. Man. Vincent Adult Man. And like one thing the show does for a lot of its like other side characters like Vincent Adult Man is that everyone like except for a few people, you know, are fooled by it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And actually, there was a very similar thing in this season yeah. where Todd builds a sex robot named Henry Fondle, and yeah. people don't realize that it's a sex robot, and it actually becomes the CEO of a company. We'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. And this this episode is also like operating on the uh, assumption that you've seen BoJack Horseman, <laughs> at least a bit of it, to know who these characters are. But if you haven't, then go watch the show. Go. What's wrong with you? Go. Get out of here. Yes, absolutely. Go watch Neil McBeal, the Navy SEAL, the albino (laughs) rhino, the albino, and the court reporter sported jorts, the jet-setting jort sporting court reporter story. (laughs) But uh, the freaking tongue twisters on the show and, like, the wordplay is also what makes it so funny. (laughs) Absolutely. Slap Princess my Carolyn gets the these guys hilarious are tongue twisters again. There's all these animal puns and, you know, just like make... <laughs> you know how like in Pixar movies, especially the early ones, like they kind of use the, hey, this is a world of toys. Hey, this is a world of monsters sort of thing. To, yeah. Or, hey, this is a world of bugs to make like meta jokes about the entire thing. This yeah. show does that a lot. There's a... Uh... One really questionable moment where, like, a cow waitress, like, brings a customer a steak and she, like, slaps it on his table, gives him a look, and he's like, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. But this show does have a very good sense of humor, despite being as serious as it is sometimes. Yeah. And also, it, like, I've seen a, well, I don't, I don't know if it's a trend or not, per se, but, like, there's been some stuff lately where, like, you see a world where humans coexist with, like, puppets or whatever, like. Uh, Not to give specific examples, Happy Time Murders, but, like, they use that as sort of, like, a, you know, an allegory for racism, and it, like, doesn't really work. Yeah, I haven't seen Happy Time Murders, so I don't know. Don't. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Uh, Parts of it are good, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, Like, it's just that they use kind of, like, you know, puppets as second-class citizens, and they don't do that here with animals. They just live with each other. You know, yeah, humans and like, animals. They really don't draw a distinction between all the animals. It's just like animals and hey, humans. And sometimes they draw focus to what the animals are. Like Princess Carolyn dates a mouse at some mm-hmm. point, and they do. <laughs> okay, and I guess the mouse family is a little bit like species, yeah. racist, yeah, whatever. But that's like you know, it, like what you would expect from mice and cats and whatnot. Will you do it in this house? Would you? Could you? With a mouse? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. 
but like it's and again, not a that's huge... the type of humor that we get in a... <laughs> yeah it's not a huge focus though like the whole racial allegory of like animals living together these characters could be all humans it's just it's more interesting that bojack is a horse and there's a a, a character called mr peanut butter who's a dog and his literal name is mr peanut butter <laughs> <laughs> yep and they even have, like, a whole island, like, Labrador Island in Canada. And yeah. this universe is an all-dog island. And yeah. it's, like, all of these super cheery people just like Mr. Peanut Butter. Yeah. It's just it's just puns. And it's good puns. Very good puns. So, uh, we haven't talked about, like, one of the main uh, tensions in the show is there's Bojack, who it seems like no matter what he does, is constantly depressed and feeling like he's not important and he's constantly looking for people to tell him that he's a good person versus yeah. mr peanut butter who basically because bojack show horsing around was successful he had his own knockoff show mr peanut butter's house which pretty much had the same premise it was you know an adult dog adopting a bu- adopting kids and yeah. you know trying to make a family this group must somehow form a family yeah it's like the whole like 90s thing with that sitcoms were doing where they basically followed the leader like oh full house is successful we'll do full house but with you know a black family i don't know well i don't know which one came <laughs> first i don't want to assume yeah i don't know I'm, my history is not well versed but um in this universe, um, like, Mr. Peanut Butter is perpetually cheery and always nice, and he accepts, like, any role that's given to him by his agents, where Bojack is, like, difficult to work with. He hates, you know, he, like, declines every role that he's offered because it's, like, below him and he wants to do something serious. And yeah. he's miserable, and Mr. Peanut Butter is just, like, constantly upbeat and nice, and it, like, drives Bojack nuts. Some and things. an interesting thing this show does is that it doesn't really paint Mr. Peanut Butter as, like, the right way to live. He has his own problems, too, and, like, you see them as the seasons go on, that he's not, like, legitimately this happy guy. He more or less kind of ignores problems in his life, and that comes up a lot in this season, too. Yeah, he also doesn't listen to other people sometimes. Like, yeah. This leads to issues with uh, his relationship with his wife, Diane. Um, yes. She's a little bit more depressed like Bojack, but she's not oh. as, like, externally destructive about it. But, um, like, especially in this season, we do get a Mr. Peanut Butter episode where we actually have him kind of have an existential crisis about, oh, my God, do I ruin people? And it's... Yeah. Uh, it's actually really interesting. I'm kind of glad that we finally got to see that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the non-spoiler version of it. We'll talk about it in the spoiler half of the episode. So. Yeah. It's just that this is a show where, like, the characters are different from when what they were in season one, yet, like, it's a show where you're con- they're constantly trying to be, like, better and kind of failing, and it's a struggle to kind of, you know, find what will make them happy. Yeah, and basically that is the arc of this entire series, is it is about this group of characters trying to find fulfillment and happiness. And, like, Bojack is very externally successful. He was the star of a great 90s sitcom, and, you know, people loved that horse from horsing around. But, you know, now it's like the 2010s, and he's frustrated that that's the only thing that he's remembered for. And so he's seeking that, like, one thing to make him feel accomplished and make him feel like, you know, he's a good person. And so in season one, it's like he's having a memoir written about his life. And again, that's supposed to be the thing that makes him get taken seriously. And Diane, who is Mr. Peanut Butter's wife, uh, is his ghostwriter. And that's how she comes into this. Um, she's one of the, like, the three main characters are probably Bojack, Princess Carolyn, Diane, with Mr. Peanut Butter, and Todd, also, yeah. Todd, by the way, is uh, somebody who slept on Bojack's couch, and it's like 15 years later, and he's still sleeping on Bojack's couch. Yeah, basically like Aaron Paul, if he was, you know, a cartoon name, named Todd. <laughs> <laughs> and he also gets character arcs. Like, at first you think he's just... At first you think that, like, he's the slack off and the bad guy, but it turns out he's one of the purest characters on the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, he's just a very aloof dude, and he just goes through these, like, really weird problems. Yeah, Todd is one of the constant, like, instigators of 
completely nonsensical things. Like, he always gets these crazy ideas, and somehow the universe happens to make them work. Yeah. And <laughs> it's totally ridiculous, some of the things. Like, um, some of the things, non-spoilery, like, in this season, there's this website, What Time Is It?, which Bojack says, yeah. for what idiots who can't remember that they have a cell phone. Yeah, like they have a clock that tells them the time right on the edge of their computer screen. Yeah, and like, um, he creates a sex robot, Henry Fondle, again, <laughs> like... <laughs> uh, yeah, because uh, Todd, as it is revealed in the end of season three, is asexual. In a very in a very good reveal, and that's been very positively positively received. And, like, he tries to satisfy his friend Emily, who was his girlfriend at one point. So he tries to create her a sex robot so she can have sex without, like, you know, the emotional hang-ups of a relationship. Yeah, and she's like, wow, this would be a great relationship if it... W- this is the best non-sex that I've ever had, but I want sex, damn it. Yeah, and, like, he creates this robot that's, like, a weird amalgam of, like, dildos and... <laughs> and, like, a blender for a face, and, like, he creates these, like messages like i want you inside me <laughs> i love when you call me father <laughs> and like that gets into like a whole thing and again the sex robot ends up uh becoming ceo of a company <laughs> yeah through like uh comedy of errors miscommunication <laughs> that the show does a lot yeah. that it is also really funny like the another really good todd episode is when he uh gets this like chicken who's been well like the weird thing about this show is that they're anthropomorphic animals but like they live in a world where they still eat animals and this episode of season two like addresses that where you have these like regular friend chickens as they call them and then uh food chickens like the chickens that are specifically you know birthed to be food and it's really creepy and if i had if i was living in this universe i'd be vegan but (laughs) like todd runs into one of these escaped food chickens and, like, tries to save her and, like, (laughs) tries to hide her from a cop. Meow, meow, fluffy fluffy face. (laughs) And, like, he's all, uh, this is my wife. Aw, Becca! (laughs) (laughs) And that's a lot of Todd's humor, again. Comedy of errors stuff, where somehow it all works out. Yeah. Also, I do like that they address that in this universe. It's not like the Cars universe where you spend the entire show questioning, wait, yeah. why? How does this work? How does this work? Explain, yeah. movie! Yeah, totally. But anyway, side topic. All right, so we should probably talk about what led to this season a bit. Yeah. we um Like Bojack's and the other characters' personal growth to season five. Yeah, so, um, again, season one was about Bojack writing his memoir uh, through Diane, his ghostwriter, and so it was kind of about just slowly, d- we start out not knowing, and this is a great way to introduce the audience to who Bojack is, because Diane is learning about who Bojack is so that she can write the book, and so we start out and he's like, hey, you're that horse from horsing around. And then as the season goes on, we kind of dig deeper and deeper into his psyche and realize he kind of has a bit of a tragic past. It's not really, you know, he actually has a lot of internal emotional issues and it just digs yeah. deeper and deeper until the eventual book that's written is pretty sad. So Yeah, pretty damning about him, really. Mm-hmm. But also like damning in the sense that it's like really honest but also it kind of makes people realize who he is and like it gets them to sort of appreciate him more i think yeah absolutely like it it gives him a lot of career opportunities like in season two he gets this role to be seabiscuit who in this universe was an actual racer who Mm -hmm. like got involved in an illegal like drug and betting ring and killed himself And Bojack has wanted to make a movie about him for years with him in the starring role, and he finally gets to do it when Diane's sort of biography about him comes out. Yep. And then predictably for Bojack, you know, a a big theme of this show is how, like, again, the 90s sitcom trope is bad stuff happens, but now everything is okay. We're family, Mm. where this show really subverts this kind of simple conflict resolution type of plot structure where 
you know, you're expecting thing happens in my life. I'm a big success now. I'm happy. But then now there's the day after that and the day after yeah. that and the day after that. And so what next? Yeah, there's a really good episode where Bojack goes to meet his friend Herb or his old friend Herb, who was the creator of Horsin' Around. And they had a falling out when Herb was outed as gay, which in the 90s was a no-no. Sadly. Yep. And, like, Herb has cancer and is dying soon, and Bojack goes to see him to hopefully make amends, and they actually do end up kind of, you know, hitting, hitting I don't want to say hitting it off, because they hit it off before, but, like, sort of kind of making amends almost, but then Bojack goes back inside once, you know, they're starting to leave, and, like, apologizes to Herb and expects an apology, but Herb's like, no, I don't forgive you. What you did was bad, and then you have to live with it. Yep. And, like, you don't see that in a lot of shows like it's all like especially in the 90s shows where it would be like a sappy music and it's solved within a sappy speech in a minute and then go home next episode hey hey you want to play that do you want to play that sound when uh he's forgiven like nah, nah, nah. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. <laughs> yeah. yeah totally See, there are other shows that play with that kind of subversion of sitcom cliches, but usually the other shows play it for laughs, and there's still the 30-minute format where at the end everything's back to normal, and hey, we're back to the same place we were last week, where this show actively is not like that. Um, No. It's like, the stories are all ongoing, things have genuine consequences, and, you know... There, a big theme of season five, too, is in, well, through the whole show, even, not just season five, is that, you know, sometimes you've done bad things and you can't go back and fix it. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, a big thing this show does, like, this show is on Netflix, so, 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 like, it could do whatever it wants with language, like, it could drop F bombs left and right. But a really cool thing it does is that it saves the F bomb once per season. And, like,. <laughs> Herb says it to Bojack after, you know, that whole speech where he says, "Uh, you abandoned me and I'll never forgive you for that. Now get the F out of my house. And like every season after has involved someone saying like the F bomb to Bojack, except for season four, where Bojack says it like in response to his mom. But we can talk about that later. Yeah. But like the majority way that people use the F bomb in this is towards Bojack and like, how he has irreparably damaged someone's relationship with him. Yeah, he constantly finds ways to mess things up. Yeah. Every single time you think that maybe he's getting better, maybe he's finally turning the corner, he does something else to screw up. Yeah. Season 2 had that with his other old friend, uh... What was her name? Charlotte. Charlotte. Charlotte, yeah. Okay. Yeah, his old, his old crush who... Like, kind of had a crush on him, I think, too, back in the 90s when she was Herb's beard. And, like, she moved away to Maine and then to Arizona where they meet up. And, well, Bojack, he's had a very rough time doing the movie and, like, just escapes from L.A. And just goes to Charlotte for sort of, like, an escape and, you know, sort of live out a fantasy he's had where he was married to her and, like, they had a family. But, of course, that goes wrong. Yeah, again, part of Bojack doing his thing where he's just searching for meaning, like some sort of easy answer to fix his problems. And yeah. yet again, another case where there aren't easy answers and things just keep going wrong. And like, what ruined his relationship with Charlotte actually comes back into play in this season in a very, yeah. really emotional way. And the consequences of that come back in a big way in this season. So yeah. We are definitely not going to talk about that yet, but yet. we will. <laughs> yeah, every season has dealt with Bojack sort of, like, trying to fix himself, but also falling back into, like, a spiral of self-abuse and a- abuse with, like, alcohol and drugs and making uh, really poor bad. choices. Drugs are bad. Mm-hmm. Like, just making bad choices with his friends, like, sleeping with Todd's friend Emily, who Todd kind of had, like, sort of romantic feelings for, but... It's complicated. Yeah, Bo- Bojack kind of sleeps with everyone. Yeah. <laughs> You've been sleeping with everyone. Larry, <laughs> little Mo with the gimpy chin, Cliff. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's also like everyone else has their own sort of arcs too. Like Diane is really like a close reflection of Bojack and how she kind of like 
is trying to find things that will gratify her life, like sort of yeah. the her marriage with Mr. Peanut Butter, mm-hmm. her job. In a, Usually with like, Diane, it manifests itself in, you know, she feels like she should be doing more good for the world. You yeah, know, it's yeah. like, geez, I'm living in L.A. and I'm living for myself. I've got to, you know, they're starving kids. I should go help them. And again, it turns out that there's not those easy answers. So now Diane is kind of going through the same cycle of trying to find answers to what will make me happy permanently when... You know, the show makes you question, does such a thing exist? Yeah, for sure. And, like, she spends a lot of time, like, trying to fix other people, but doesn't really spend a lot of time on herself. Absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, like, Princess Carolyn has the whole, like, arc of trying to be happy with relationships herself, and eventually realizing she doesn't need someone else to make her happy, and then also, but also trying to, like, be a mother and balance work life with their personal life. And it, there's a lot of real, like, arcs that the characters go through throughout each season. And sort of, like, it goes back and forth, like, between optimistic and pessimistic. Like, will they be able to do it? Will they not? Like, they, we still don't have a, like, legit answer on that yet. Yeah. Th- there is a really great quote from this show, which it talks about... Um, well, I don't know if it's actually a quote, but it's a theme of the show that, like... Life isn't necessarily all happy or all sad, all good or all bad. It's just this series of moments, some good, some bad. And, you know, they just happen and life goes on. Yeah. Um, Where again, like in the sitcom formula and heck, even in just, you know, like even movies, any drama in general, you know, we expect closure. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's bad closure, because in season four, Bojack kind of goes through this thing with his mom, Beatrice, who is uh, suffering from dementia, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And, like, she's in this old folks home. She doesn't recognize Bojack. And, like, he wants to sort of have this moment where she finally recognizes him and, like, he can just sort of, like, put his hand on her shoulder, lean in and say, F you, mom. Like, that would be (laughs) that would be closure for him. But it, it doesn't work like that in the actual show. Nope. Yeah, this show really does not give closure on a lot of things. It's just some things happen and you work towards them and expect closure and then they just slowly end and you never really get an answer and you move on to something else, which is surprisingly realistic. Yeah, it's depressingly realistic, but it's realistic. Yeah, It's almost like a lot of other shows are what we wish life could be like. We want life to have easy answers. We want to create this like narrative for ourselves, where we work hard and finally do the big thing and success where Bojack is more about the reality of it, where like we convince ourselves that we're doing this big thing, but in the end it's not, it's just, okay, moving on. Yeah. And keep going. For sure. So season five, is basically about Bojack being part of this new TV show for what time is it now dot com called uh Filbert. And Filbert. a lot of Yes, Filbert. A lot of the show like Oh boy. I'm nauseous. I'm <laughs> nauseous. I'm <laughs> nauseous. Turn the page. What okay, no. <laughs> Different Filbert. <laughs> <laughs> but like a lot of the show is about him like trying well a lot of the season i should say is about him trying to find like a connection to the character of filbert like the first episode is all about him being all i don't like this character very much because it is a sort of reflection on who he is yeah for better or for worse yeah and even like the 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 set design for filbert's house is his house because (laughs) it was a actually a, a callback to season one where Todd passes off Bojack's house for David Boreanaz's. <laughs> it's like, I've never seen... The showrunner's like, I've never seen your house. The set designer based this off David Boreanaz's house. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, a lot of the themes of this season are sort of reflective on the Me Too movement a bit. Yeah, like, definitely one of the big underlying themes of this season is, like... Guys who have done severely reprehensible things Mm -hmm. and, like, sexually abused women 
basically Hollywood kind of just says, oh, well, you know, that was in the past. They deserve a second chance. And, you know, like this show really asks the question, should we forgive these people? Are we enabling their behavior by constantly forgiving them? And when they don't actually change and again, that's a big theme of the show is, you know, is someone a good person or a bad person quote? And if someone never actually shows that they are a good person through their actions, should we still, still consider them a good person or root for them to get better when it becomes clear that they're never going to get better. Yeah, there's a Mel Gibson, like, parallel character in this called Vance who goes off on some really misogynistic and racist rants and, like, every couple of years he kind of has a resurgence and then he does some, like, stupid crap again and then, like, it's a cycle. Kind of like how it is in actual Hollywood. Unfortunately. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, this, like, this season is definitely kind of, uh a lot of people have been speculating like is this suggesting that like harvey weinstein is eventually like just gonna get forgiven like oh well that was in the past and all of a sudden you know it's like nothing he didn't really face any consequences like he's not in the public life but he's still rich living in this giant house and you know famous and like where the people that he abused not so much yeah totally totally so So i think at this point, we're going to delve into more of Season 5, so if you haven't seen it yet, go see it. Yeah, I think go. this is our official spoiler warning territory, so yeah, Season yeah. 5, basic summary again, it's about Filbert, which is a new show that Bojack's working on, and Diane comes onto the show to help make it better when their main writer kind of has issues, and yeah, <laughs> then it really delves into that question of forgiveness and sexual abuse and Go watch it if you haven't, and uh, yeah, now we're going into spoiler territory, because this season has given us a lot to talk about. A lot. Like, the main thing is that I think with uh, Bojack in this series kind of relating to Filbert and using that, like, he says, he says in, like, the 10th episode, I really relate to Filbert, and it's nice to see a character like him that looks like me on the screen, and Diane has a problem with that, because she didn't write Filbert like that. Yeah, like, she wrote the character to be more relate. Like, she wrote the character to be deep, because, like, it's depth and nuance that makes a character interesting, but... Yeah. Now, because she made it a good character, it's, like, objectively bad people are using that character as an excuse of, oh, well, like, other people are like me, so that makes it okay. No. Yeah. No, it is not okay. This is... This is basically the show's... Like, the show, Bojack itself answering to people who see the Bojack character as sort of like a mirror of themselves and not really seeing that as a bad thing. Because I really love Bojack as a character, but I recognize that he is not a good person (laughs) most of the time. This season, like, there was a big question going around. Should we still be rooting for Bojack to get better? Like, does he deserve our sympathy and us rooting for him at this point? Yeah. After, like, literally choking someone on set. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, Jesus, Bojack. Like, there's this whole thing where, like, in one of the later episodes, he says that he has, like, pain pills for his back, but it turns out he probably doesn't need them. And he's just using that as an excuse to, like, get more pills and, you know, get all doped up on them. Yeah, I I actually kind of have a theory about this show season where um, there's an episode in this season where, you know, his mom dies and he constantly talks about his family about um, like, well, my family screwed me up and almost uses that as an excuse to keep feeling bad about himself. So especially with this season where he definitely used pain pills which at first was legitimate, but now it's like weeks later and he's still taking them and addicted to them. And he's just using yeah. the excuse that he's in pain. So I really wondered, like, is he still legitimately traumatized by his family? Or is he just mentally using that abuse as an excuse to keep feeling that, be- you know, to keep excusing himself from his bad behavior and his like almost For addiction sure. to this depraved lifestyle i'm actually watching another show right now that 
delves into that question, like, am I, are you using your past experience with this person for, like, an excuse because, you know, God forbid they changed? So it, it's interesting to see it from the other angle, where, like, Bojack did have a legitimately bad past, but, like, is he using that as a crutch to sort of, like, be all, oh, well, I need to drink, I need to use pain pills to forget about, you know, my life. Yeah, there is definitely, um, as somebody who spent a lot of time um, talking in uh, the trans community, like, a lot of people, this is not a majority, I would say, but there is a definite subgroup who just kind of uses their, like, it's kind of just a common LGBT culture thing for the teen years to suck. Everybody treated you like crap yeah. and made fun of you and you never got to, like... You never really got the self-expression that you wanted. And now, like, these people are just now dealing with this trauma in their 30s. And, like, for most people, they get over it. But uh, there are there's yeah. just some group that they fester in it. And it's like, for weeks and months and years on end, they just keep talking about how much their life sucked and keep feeling bad about themselves. And they never really move forward. So... You know, there's some definite parallels there where um, for anybody who had a bad past and is now feeling depression, you know. Yeah, and like, at what point do you, like, take this and get help with it? Yeah, and that's another thing. Bojack hasn't actually got professional help from anybody. He sees, like, he goes to see Diane's, like, therapist for a while and, like has sort of lunchly talks, as he calls it, with her, but doesn't really, like, follow up on that. Yeah, like, this is a very, very delicate topic to go into, because you risk, yeah. if you go too far one way, it's like, um, you're accusing people of, you know, like, well, how dare you feel bad about this bad thing that happened to you, where on the other hand, it's like... It's like victim-blaming, almost? Yeah, it... <laughs> It's just, if you go too far one way or the other, it really risks, you know, having bad consequences. So, yeah, you know, this is a topic that needs to be dealt with with a lot of nuance, which this show does. It does, for sure. And, you know, that's not a common thing at all. Like, that's one of the reasons why the show is so good is that it handles these, like, heavy, heavy adult topics that like tear people up internally about you know where do i find purpose in life and yeah it dissects them completely for sure like even diane who sort of is bojack's kick in the pants like telling him hey you shouldn't relate to filbert because you want an excuse for your own bad feelings like you need to get better mm -hmm. like the season ends with her going like you know looking on at Bojack going to rehab and, like, kind of, like, sort of questioning herself, you can tell, as she drives away. Yeah, like, that was one of the discussion topics that I wanted to ask about. Like, do you think Diane is okay? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this season ended on a super melancholy note with her. It's like, Bojack actually goes to rehab, and she drops him off, and, you know, like, she smiles goodbye, but then, like, looks downright miserable and drives back yeah. and the season ends with her driving into a tunnel and uh playing uh i forget what the name of the song is it's a it's a kind of melancholy song that's all yeah. you really need but like the whole season she's been dealing with her own like you know demons and yeah this is definitely a down season for diane yeah she's divorced from mr peanut butter she like is sort of trying she goes back to vietnam to sort of discover her rediscover her roots but doesn't really find them because she is like you know born and bred american la well she was born in boston but she really found her roots in la and like she she really is like a stranger in a strange land in vietnam yeah there were some people that did speculate like there's one episode where all of the characters um switch to being like alternate versions of their self and yeah. it's the therapist talking about her. Bobo the angsty zebra. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Chocolate Hazelnut Spread. Yeah. That episode. Like Princess Carolyn showing up like for five seconds as a crab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, anyway. And Diane is represented by Princess Diana. Um, yeah. And so 
there's an internet fan theory, which I really, really hope is not true. You better f***ing not show. I you better not. Um, you better not. Okay, that's my one F-bomb for this show. Um, one F-bomb. <laughs> anyway, um, the end of the season is Diane driving into a tunnel. So people are scared that, oh no, she was represented by Princess Diana earlier in this season. Princess Diana drive, or died driving into a tunnel. Oh no, is Diane dead? And again, you better not show, no, Di- <laughs> Diane yeah, and Princess Carolyn yeah. are my two favorite characters. Don't do it. <laughs> but it, it like also expresses that Diane is sort of like a helper of other people, but she doesn't really help herself. Yeah, which is an unfortunate thing, and... It's a real thing. Yeah. And, like, this is kind of a feminism thing, but, like, um, there's people that are... Do you know the, like, is this a bird meme with the butterfly? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, there's one that circulates in feminist circles where it's, like, a guy with emotional problems, and um, there's a girl that he likes coming towards him, and he says, is this a therapist? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, there is kind of a tendency for people to, like, almost use the women in their life as therapists. And Diane kind of fills that role just because she's... Yeah, for pretty much all the characters. Yeah, she wants to help people, so people... Like, Todd she goes ends to her up, at one yeah. point. Oh, sorry. So, you know, she ends up dealing with everyone else's emotional problems when she has a ton of problems herself that she doesn't want to confront. Yeah. And, like, she doesn't really feel, like, safe going back to her therapist because Bojack was talking to her. Yeah, that was kind of another crappy thing that Bojack did this season, is that Diane specifically said, this therapist is my thing. She's where I come to talk about personal things, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> you're taking that feeling of safety away from me, and Bojack completely does not listen. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, now she doesn't have a therapist anymore because of that. Yeah, and, like, you could argue she could go find, like, another one, but, like, it's complicated. Yeah, still, it's just a really crappy thing that Bojack did. It is, really, it is. And, like, she and Mr. Peanut Butter, like, try to stay friends throughout the season as he's, like, getting into this relationship with this new, young, very younger woman. Pickles. Pickles. Oh, she's very cute. <laughs> she's, like, a waitress at Bojack's restaurant. because he's he has a little pug. Oh, it's like, I think it's the first time that Mr. Peanut Butter's dated another dog. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and yeah. Like, Pickles and is... Oh, sorry. Big props to the show, by the way. Again, Mr. Peanut Butter finally gets, a, a, like, an emotional growth episode. Yeah. Only to completely throw that emotional growth away in the end, but we'll get to that. Yeah, cause I was about to say, Pickles is, like, very, very young. She's, like, 25. And Mr. Peanut Butter is probably around Bojack's age, and, like... There's an episode that goes into, like, all three of his past failed relationships, along with Pickles, and it goes into, like, Mr. Peanut Butter realizing that a, probably not a small part of why he's been divorced three times is because of his inability to change and listen to his wives. Yeah, like... And sort of stay stagnant. Yeah, he doesn't... <laughs> that's what I love about high school girls. I grow up, <laughs> they stay the same age. Oh, no. Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> Whatever your character was in that movie. Anyway. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> well, I was just referencing the family guy, but whatever. Yeah, and uh, he does, like, question if, like, Diane basically tells him that he needs to, you know, be an, an adult. He needs to, like, grow up, basically. And he kind of accepts that, but then Pickles is a 25-year-old millennial. So, no offense to millennials, but so she's like, yeah, yeah I'm I never quit dumping yeah. on us. <laughs> yeah, I never want to grow up. And but Mr. Peanut Butter's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like, especially at the end of the season, it's like um, Pickles is like, oh no, y- you want to talk? Nobody says we need to talk. Hey, happy birthday! And yeah, you know, instead of kind of. Instead of confronting his problems and admitting that maybe, you know, he just didn't learn anything. He gets down and no. says, will you marry me? And, yeah. And what makes it worse is that he was gonna tell her that he was cheating on her with Diane. Because, like, but, yeah, they were having, an, you know, an affair, like, a twist. Because <laughs> one, <laughs> one great what thing. What a twist? A twist, a twist. Because, like, Diane staying at this, like, like crappy motel called La, La Triste. So that's like that was like clever ah. foreshadowing. <laughs> Puns. Clever foreshadowing. And like 
you know, they both, it's just Mr. Peanut Butter kind of looks at their affair like, oh, me and Diane are going to get back together. But Diane looks at herself like really badly and that doesn't help her at all in the finale. Yeah, no. It's like, man, this show. I know, this show. It's heavy, man. That's too much, man. Yeah, that is... We probably need to put this into the non-spoiler thing, but yeah, fair warning watching this show, like... <laughs> too late now. This ah. is heavy stuff. Like, it's actually hard to binge watch this because man you just feel bad for these characters yeah. so much and you need to just step back and breathe for a minute to take it all in because it's heavy stuff and it's funny you say that because for a lot of other netflix shows i watch like i do have to take a break every so often because like there's only so many hour long episodes i can watch at a time but with bojack i actually did like the first time i watched season one i streamed like I binged a bunch of those episodes, like, nearly the whole season, I think, and it's been the same for every season, because, like, it's terrible situations that these people get into, but, like, I'm so invested with them and the jokes and, like, the sad, sad sadness that I just yeah. can't stop watching. I mean, it's the kind of show that you want to watch more and more and more of, because they're always building towards, you know, these, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Is this character that we care about gonna be okay? And... yeah. But sometimes it just gets so, like, heavy mm, that mm, you have mm. to stop, even though you're dying to know what happens. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, like, Princess Carolyn in this season uh. also has a subplot where, you know, she's trying to adopt a child. And, God, I you know, it's just, ah, oh, I want to see her get closure, damn it. Yeah, for sure. Like, she's been... Uh, in season four, she just had it rougher than anyone. Like, this yeah. was, like... She... During the entire season, she was, like, the highest of anyone. Because, she, you know, she was finally in a relationship. And she was happy in that relationship. And, you know, it's like all her dreams are coming true. And then it's just, like, bam. Shattered. Completely nothing left over at the end of it. And that was yeah. just, like... Oh, my God. Poor like, Princess Carol. <laughs> like, even the like necklace she wears that she thought was an old family heirloom was just like a cheap like fake not necklace yep like dang that's cold yeah and so yeah especially in this episode i was like super invested I was like come on give princess carolyn a good season you know she she needs to be happy damn it yeah no more tragedy and she kind of gets it because she kind of well she not kind of she does eventually adopt a baby at the end but yeah it's... she does actually get a positive note at the end of the season probably the most positive of any of the characters who were yeah. struggling this season yeah like with bojack and diane they have this dialogue at the end of like well what happens if i go to rehab but i'm still the same person that i've always been afterwards and you know it actually acknowledges hey this is a genuine possibility and yeah but you know nothing else has worked your entire life so you might as well try but yeah like i you put in the notes here that it also could be like a sort of uh half and half neutral thing because like pc may not realize how much of a you know hard work a baby could be and like maybe using it as a sort of feeling of her own personal worth and achievement because she's always wanted a child and yeah you like, don't know you don't know if she in the context to the end of this season it is a purely positive note but yeah. the show yeah. gives us reason to wonder if it is always going to be positive yeah because babies are hard work like it's yeah. gonna be tough for her to juggle her own you know personal and work lives together yeah, like, this episode has a backstory episode with Princess Carolyn where it shows us her in high school with her mom and her then-boyfriend, and she accidentally gets pregnant, and her mom, who has always been, you know, like, Princess Carolyn idolized Amelia Earhart growing up, and, you know, she wanted to be ambitious, and her mom kind of resented her for that, trying to, like, drag her down and, you know, like kind of saying like don't dream too much we're in it you know like we're in a hick town nobody ever does anything like that here and yeah for sure she ends up getting pregnant via the high school quarterback and all of a sudden her mom is 
like, oh, hey, you're you're finally doing something worthy for this family. Like, you're going to bring us into riches. This is the richest family in town and the most successful, you know. And yeah. she has a miscarriage and she feels like... And so there's still that lingering resentment all these years later about how, you know, she feels like, kind of like a failure and mm-hmm. is still kind of hanging on to that negative relationship with her mom where, you know... I don't know. She's just such a complicated character where objectively yeah. on the outside, she's successful. She's hyper competent and she's constantly fixing the messes that everyone else creates and doing a damn good job of it. But yeah, uh, like everyone on the show is complicated except for Todd. <laughs> yeah. Todd's just, Todd's just great. <laughs> but even he goes through sort of like a sort of arc in this where he's dating this other asexual character and like, it goes into this sort of thing where, like, even if you're, you know, if two people are asexual, that doesn't mean they're compatible. Yeah, absolutely. And they pretty quickly realize this. This is the best not sex I've ever had, but I'm not sure about the emotional part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, it also, the show has really, like, shed a real positive light on asexuality, I think. Definitely. Like, there's a whole episode where Todd goes with his girlfriend to her parents' house, and her parents and sister are all, like, involved in some sexual, like, you know, franchise. Like, her her mom's a porn star, and her dad writes erotic novels, and, <laughs> like, there's this huge yeah. comedy of errors, and, like, at the end, <laughs> like, the, it cuts off screen, like, what? When, you know, it's finally revealed that their daughter is asexual, it goes to one long but respectful talk later. Wow, it's nice that your parents were, like accepted you. <laughs> yeah. That episode actually does have a lot of parallels with, again, LGBT culture. It's like, you know, that's almost like how it is when there's somebody dating another person of the same sex who's still closeted. And, you know, it's like, I'm inviting my friend over for dinner. And then, you know, yeah. it's like the family doesn't know that uh, they're actually dating. And Yeah, for sure. Which I guess I've never dated someone of the same sex, so I don't know, but I've been around enough uh, LGBT people to hear hear about it. For sure. But, like, the major thing that I think Todd goes through in this, other than that, is that he builds Henry Fondle, and <laughs> Henry yeah. Fondle in the, like, final episode, or close to the final episode, comes, like, under fire for his, like, sexual innuendos. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of the Me Too thing with the show, it's like a literal sex robot is the CEO of a company. Yeah. What and that Todd, say? who made the robot, is like, no, Henry Fondle is a sex robot. You mean metaphorically? No, he is literally a sex robot. No sex robot should be the CEO of a company. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, when, you know, the company goes under and they're both on the street like some other big shot CEO, CEO shows up and says to Henry Fondle hey you should come work for us for some time you do know this guy just yeah. got fired for sexually harassing someone right yeah he's just he's ready to go back <laughs> he learned his lesson yep. yeah this again the show definitely goes into the Hollywood culture of just like forgiving objectively awful people because yeah. hey old boys club you know we gotta yeah, stick for sure. up for yeah. Where the allegory probably ends is when uh, Todd takes Henry out to like a field and like tases him to death. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, father. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Oh god, I laugh so much. <laughs> that was great. Poor Henry Fondle, rest in peace. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, uh, one of the early episodes is titled bojack is a feminist and it goes into the mel gibson type character and he's gonna be brought on to philbert as philbert's partner and like bojack is sort of like accidentally roped into like the backlash against that and seen as this feminist icon because of it even though he really yeah. doesn't know what he's talking <laughs> about and is using the you know his title as a feminist quote unquote to like you know get brownie points yeah, basically, like, um, we talked about um, the Mel Gibson-type character who came on his show. Bojack, like, refuses to work with, work with him. And all of a sudden, despite never doing anything feminist in his entire life, yeah. now he's, like, a feminist icon. And, you know, he goes on the daytime talk show, The Squawk. And, um, <laughs> that was great. Totally not The View, but whatever. <laughs> um, 
And, you know, because people clap for him when he says things that should completely not be controversial, yeah, like, like, hey, this bad person should not, you know, like... Yeah, how about we don't choke any woman, period? Like, ugh. <laughs> And then, ugh, that, that payoff at the end. <sighs> like, there are little lines in this show that, like, earlier episodes that come back to play, and then when you rewatch it, you're like, oh, no, damn you, show... Damn you, Bojack! <laughs> but like, yep. but like, yeah, like the whole, you know, saying, you know, obvious things as a, like a man, and somehow like that makes you a huge feminist. It's like, it plays on the whole like, you know, feminist icons like uh, Louis Black. Louis Black is that his name? Um, I don't know. The, I'm not aware. <laughs> the, of guy, the guy, the guy, the guy, the comedian guy who got in trouble last year. And and uh, Josh Wheaton, like these people who you know talk the talk, yeah. but didn't necessarily walk the lo- the walk the walk. Yeah, like Josh Wheaton, especially like he made Buffy, so everybody's like, "Oh wow, powerful, empowering woman person, like totally awesome." And then it turns like ever since the leaked first draft script for Wonder Woman came out, people oh. kind of realized, <laughs> "Nope, yeah. he yeah. is just just problematic as a lot of the other guys trying to write female characters." Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, but again, yeah. like again, talking about Hollywood and how they yeah. sort of like you know pat guys like Hollywood wants to believe that it is feminist, despite um, yeah. still very much having an ingrained culture of male dominance in the field. And the show well, kind of holds them accountable for that. Uh-huh. Also, uh, it was Louis CK, not Louis Black. There's there we go. Okay. There's a difference. I'm sorry. Louis. Black. That's why You're I didn't cool. recognize it. I'm like, what? Louis Black. You're cool. You're cool. Louis Black. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I walked across the street and there was a Starbucks <laughs> and then I looked back and there was a Starbucks. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Lewis Black is awesome. I yeah. hope he doesn't have any problems. Yeah. Him. I hope not. <clears throat> anyway. But like going back, going back to, uh, you know, the whole dialogue and how it comes back in this, there's an episode called free churro. That is probably the best episode in the season. A and plus like, episode. My yeah. God. Like, the whole thing is just Bojack at his mom Beatrice's funeral, and it's just one huge monologue about Bojack trying to, you know, make sense of who his mother was and what he was to her, and, like, it's just really, really, (laughs) really heavy. Yeah, creator Ralphie, yeah, I'm gonna mess up his name, Ralph, Raphael Bob Waksberg, is it? Yeah, that's about right, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, whatever. Um, Sorry, Raph. He said he... He said he wanted to do an episode that was nothing but a character talking for 30 minutes, but didn't really get the chance until now, where now he has the chance. Because Bojack is giving a eulogy at his mother's funeral, and it is just Bojack talking. Yeah, and like... it's really not something that I've ever seen done in a show before. Yeah, and... there's really set camera angles, and like, it, you know... You never see the audience until the very end that he's talking to, but, like, it's just really well done. Yeah, like, basically the, the catalyst for the episode is that, you know, he remembers his mom said, I see you, and he wondered, you know, is this what I've been waiting for the whole time, just for my mom to acknowledge that I'm there? What was she even talking about? And, you know, just, he goes on this monologue for, like, 30 minutes while... Also kind of at the same time insulting her, like, yeah. mocking her, quote, dead face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. But, God, again, this is just one of those super heavy episodes, and it digs deep, deep, deep. Yeah, for into, sure. Into, like, problematic relationships with parents. Yeah, he equates it to watching this show called Becker that wasn't very good, but he kept watching it because, like, he hoped that it would be good. And like a quote that he says is, and that's what losing a parent is like. It's like Becker. Suddenly you realize you'll never have the good relationship you wanted. And as long as they were alive, even though you'd never admit it, part of you, the stupidest G-damn part of you, was still holding on to that chance. And you didn't even realize until that chance that it went away. My mother is dead and everything is worse now. Because now I will never have a mother who looks at me from across a room and says, Bojack Horseman, I see you. Yeah. And, like, the whole, like, 
crux of that ICU, it, he figures out like mid monologue that they were in the intensive care like unit, and then he says, "I see you." Oh god! Yeah. <laughs> this but, episode especially kind of hit the nose for me. Just um, secondarily, like. Watching Lindsay Ellis's video about Guardians of the Galaxy Part oh, 2, yeah. where she talks about how it is to have a relationship with a parent that was complicated. Yeah. Um, yeah, this definitely really feels like it, where you're kind of still hanging on to that person that you want them to be, but that person really isn't there anymore. And how do you reconcile the difficult parts of the end of their life with... Um, you know, this, you still want them to be your parent, even yeah. if they objectively weren't a very good parent. Uh-huh. And, like, one really, the whole episode is just Will Arnett. Like, he pl- he also plays his father, who shows up in a flashback in the beginning. And, like, Bojack is waiting for him after soccer practice, I guess. And his dad rolls in, and, like, Bojack waves, and his dad, like, yes, yes, I see you, get in. Yep. Like, just that seeing that again it's like oh man i see you and then his dad goes on like a rant about how you know none of this is his fault yeah basically shirking blame to bojack for his failed marriage and his like failed life basically so again with this show again where it makes it even when bojack was told i see you it was not in a positive light yeah for sure you know his dad was kind of (laughs) awful very awful like the, yeah. at the very end of his speech he's like well i guess your mom taught you a valuable lesson you can't trust anybody and then like bojack's quiet and his dad goes thank you <laughs> like <laughs> really terrible but really <laughs> darkly funny yeah <laughs> but yeah that episode just they knocked it out of the park like yeah. will arnett's voice acting a plus like they subtly changed the lighting the direction they hold on him at moments where you're supposed to kind of be uncomfortable, like, you know, it's like they hold the camera on you and force you to do it, and then they subtly change it so the framing is a bit different, the angle is a bit different, and just kind of to subtly match up with what he's saying. And it's just enough that it keeps it interesting, and you follow the monologue, but... And it's not just, like, looking at a guy talking straight on for 30 minutes, yeah, but yeah. Um, it still very much has the feel of... this. Is an, it, it was just another episode where they really went uh, to its logical extreme with an idea that they had, kind of like the Undersea episode where nobody uh-huh. talks for the entire... That was also yeah, great. It's the opposite of the Undersea episode. The Undersea yeah. episode, nobody talks for the episode, and then there's a joke at the end of it where... and. This is like the opposite of that, where somebody is talking the entire time and you never see anything else, and then there's a joke at the end of it. Yeah, yeah. Both really good jokes <laughs> at the end of very <laughs> heavy episodes. That was my biggest laugh of the entire season, was the end of that episode. I laughed for like a minute straight. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. This show, again, it's depressing and heavy, but I talked about this with the Disney movies. It's like laughing with characters and being entertained by characters makes their drama all the more heavy because you care about them. You yeah. see the parts of them that you like and you want them to do, to get better and to be happy. Yeah. And again, sure. it's, but it's very different than the Disney movies where in Disney, everything is always a happy ending where in this, there are no happy endings. It's just a ever evolving chain of highs and lows flowing down the river in perpetuity. Yeah. Until yeah. one day it just stops. For sure. Anyway. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> That's the whole like thing with episode eleven too. Were you quoting episode eleven? Huh? Episode eleven where like of this season where Bojack has the like, you know oh, hallucinations yeah. and like he imagines his co star on Filbert like singing a whole show and da- song and dance number about like how you can't stop dancing until the curtain falls. Yep. And again, that was another super creative episode. Like yeah. that was, kind- it's kind of like one of the drug induced paranoia type episodes, like similar to something that Satoshi Kone of uh, like perfect blue millennium actress fame or David Lynch would do. Yeah. And it just like, is constantly going in and out of reality and you don't know what's real and what's a dream anymore and 
it's just like a total mind bleep. Yeah. And they've had episodes like that before, like season one's episode 11 and season three's where like they go on huge drug benders and like there's crazy hallucinations. But this one, like they've built up sort of Bojack's, like the line between what Bojack sees as the show and what he sees as real life. Because like he he starts wearing the Filbert costume offset and it even bleeds into the theme song where he's starting to wear the suit immediately when he wakes up in the theme song. Yeah. And the entire season, they were blending the reality with the show. Like, again, you talked about how the set takes place kind of in his house. and Yeah. You know. Until eventually he can't tell the difference and he actually starts choking out Gina, his co-star, and, like, yep. re- like really actually choking her and he has to be pulled off her. And that's when Gina drops the F-bomb. What, is, what the F is wrong with you? Yep. And that, that, See, and I actually kind of forgot about the whole f bomb once per season thing. So yeah, it's it's easy to forget about because like it's just done so well. And like I actually forgot about it until Gina said it. Like, oh, that's it. That's the f bomb. <laughs> yep. One of the like <laughs> the show is one of the ones that you can watch it and keep getting more and more things out of it the more that you rewatch it just like all the little subtle things that only happen once per season. You know, like little parallels that you didn't notice little like circular motions and echoes that you didn't notice uh good stuff good stuff very good stuff so um one more thing that i definitely wanted to discuss is like the show has a question running on and it's brought back up in this season are we actually more than the sum of our actions? Like, can we consider someone to be a good person and root for them to be good if they never actually do anything good? What do you think? Like, are we still supposed to be rooting for Bojack to be a good person? And, like, is he somebody that, like, this kind of changed my perspective on him a lot. Like, I'm not sure going forward. It's like, am I going to be rooting for Bojack in the next season? Yeah, I think it sort of depends on what he does. Which is kind of the easy answer, but, like, I don't know. Like, at what point do you give up on somebody? That's another question that, like, they ask and Diane kind of answers. Well, not really answers, but she gives her own explanation on it. For sure. And again, it's like, the show tackles it with nuance. Like, again, all the Hollywood guys. It's like, at what point do you forgive them and hope that they become a better person? And at what point do you give up because they demonstrated that they're never going to get any better? Yeah, for sure. And I feel like it's inviting us to ask that question about Bojack. Yeah. We'll have to but, wait I mean, till next we'll year. We'll have to wait. Yeah. If they, like, I don't know when they're planning on ending the show or how they're going to end it, but, like, it's just one of those things where they ask you, all right, where are we going to go ne- next year? What's going to yeah. happen? This is one of the shows that I am, like, at the end of the season is like, ah, oh, I want to see more, you know. Yeah, for like, sure. Not a lot of shows can build that tension where you, like, just have to watch the next season, you know, like... Yeah. This show just pulls you along constantly. Yes. Also, I was actually wondering, like, is there a chance that this was the finale? Like, yeah. Princess Carolyn gets closure, um, Bojack Horseman kind of gets closure, um, and, like... Becca, who is not here today, but she has this theory with her brother Mitch that, like, Bojack is kind of paralleling the five stages of grief. And in interviews, they talked about how season five would be like the season of acceptance, which is the last yeah. stage of grief. So I don't know. Is there a chance that this is the last season? I hope not, but. I don't think so. I think they would, you know, advertise that more if this was the last season. Yeah, possibly. I don't know. And also, I have a friend who is going to animate the next season, but I won't say who. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, okay. You okay, must, we're good then. We're good you then. must Thank believe you for... me. <laughs> All right. Thank you for I'm satiating not... my fears. Yeah, I'm not making that up. I, have, I actually have a friend who's animating the next season. Okay. Because I want to see more, damn it! <laughs> and you will. And we will talk about it more next year. Hopefully not yes, we will. this late. <laughs> yep. And hopefully he actually shows some signs of getting better. I hope, you know. Yes. It's like, be better, what he did this season was awful, and, you know, I don't know if I should still be rooting for him, but he's still a character that, it's like, 
God, you just want to see him do something good. Yeah, for sure. Especially now that he has Hollyhock in his life. Ah, uh, like, Hollyhock. You know... Have we gone this long without talking about Hollyhock? She's so Yeah, good. We, we did go this long without talking about Hollyhock. She's so good. She's a Bojax, Bojax, Bojax uh, half-sister, who we thought was his daughter in the last season. But, like, she's very cute. <laughs> she's very <laughs> sweet and sincere. Yeah, like, she's so far the only character, like, I think, that has told Bojack that she loves him. And, like, it's so it's so cute. Yeah. And it was kind of a bummer that their only interaction this season was a negative one, where he spent the entire time they were together trying to get more pills. Yeah, for sure. That was really depressing. Yeah. Well, hopefully we see more Holly Hawk in the future. Yeah, another character that I'm rooting for, like, for, like good things to happen to them. Yeah. <sighs> but yeah. All right. I think that's going to do it for us over here yep. on animation. I think that is time. On Destination Animation. So, all right. Yeah. Any final j- thoughts? Final thoughts is Bojack Horseman Season 5, another knockout. It's great. It is. Final thought for me is, back in the 90s, I was in a very famous TV show. Oh, yeah, they do, a, yeah. they do a lot of w- cool things with the ending theme in this season. Yeah, actually, they didn't have the traditional ending in most of the episodes. Yeah, there was like a Vietnam- Vietnamese version, a Halloween spooky music version, <laughs> a remix by another band. It was good. Yo, back in the 90s. No. <laughs> Great. All right. So once again, I'm Jason Knott. You can find my reviews of animated movies, live action movies, and much more on my review blog, Whatever Reviews on Blogger.com. And I'm Carrie Drebolo, YouTube's animation critic. You can find my anime reviews at Animation Critic, all one word, on YouTube. And I want to thank Mitch for our theme song. You can find him on Mitch D. McGraw at Twitter.com. Hopefully I got that right. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yes. All right, and, and Bex, she's not here, but we'll still say uh, she is at Rebexersis.com. So check yes. her out. And check she'll be back soon. Donate to her Patreon. Do it. Absolutely. Do it, you cowards. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. That's going to do it for us here. Mitch, play us out. Play us out, Mitch. Do it. Coward. <laughs> <laughs>